Hello everybody, my name is Saurav. I work for Facebook's World AI team. And as you can tell from my accent, I'm from Boston. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, we are a team that provides the base map data to power our map experiences across uh, all the products that we have. And uh, like uh, any other consumer of OSM, uh, our major challenges are around freshness and correctness, how up to date we are with the base face map, uh, face OSM data, and how correct our data is. Uh, in this presentation, we're going to extend on our talk that we gave last year. Don't worry, I'm going to summarize what I spoke last year. And uh, we're going to talk, focus mainly on uh, how the challenges we faced when we tried to scale our process to ingesting the whole world, as well as uh, the investments that we have done into machine augmented review to detect like bad changes, vandalism, and stuff like that. Uh, so just to reiterate, our vision has always been to continuously ingest uh, and integrate changes that are done to the upstream OSM into the local copy. Uh, and our primary uh, sort of metrics are freshness and correctness. I'll expound on them later. And previously, we uh, talked about uh, our project Mobius, which is sort of applying everything that we know about like source code, continuous uh, ingestion, and sort of treating data as code kind of process. And uh, this sort of algorithm we created called logical chain sets, or as we call them, lochas. And locha is Hindi for a snafu like a tiny little error that screws up everything. So it's kind of apt. <laughs> and uh, we did a pilot of to ingest the changes that we had done in Thailand for our world uh, AI-assisted uh, road mapping. And that worked well. So we said, yeah, why not? Like, you know, we turn on the button. And the challenge became, can we do this at scale? Can we do this regularly for the whole world? And as you know, OSM has become much more of a fire hose. Like, it's like drinking from a fire hose with, like, Daily, on an average day, there are two to four million changes coming in. And the whole challenge has been as to how to do this on a cadence while maintaining our metrics of freshness and correctness. So uh, just a primer on how Mobius works. This works rather than trying to ingest continuously. It takes a diff between uh, your the global OSM copy and the local copy. I just pardon my drawing here. They're not quite aligned, but yeah, let me know if anything is not clear. So. We take the diff, and then the diff is flattened out under a list of changes to individual features. Because uh, if you think of changes, you have either created a, a feature, or you have deleted a feature, or you have edited a feature, like changed an attribute or geometry of something. So in a way, these are like individual atomic changes. We take them, and we have a clustering algorithm, which we covered last time, which actually regroups them into the logical chain sets. So for this, we instead of considering OSM as this laid out graph, ordered graph of like nodes, ways, and this, we view it more as a connectivity graph. So if you change it something here, we try to see how far the change propagates to maintain its geometric consistency. And that's how we create these sort of logically grouped changes that uh, have interesting mathematical properties, which I'll cover briefly. But then we take those lists and we pass them through a review. One of the properties that they have is they have a binary accept reject. Like, I want to call it Tinder for diffs, but maybe that's a bit stretching it. So you have a left swipe and right swipe mechanic for accepting or rejecting a change. And the geometrical consistency is guaranteed either way. So in this way, a subset. It, so this is actually inspired from the concept of cherry picking in source code uh, management. So you can cherry pick a set of changes. And because these are spatial changes, you could index them. Right? Now you can say that I just want to look at road changes in Thailand, or I just want to look at buildings added in Minnesota. So that actually passes through the reviewer. Let's say your reviewer found that. And if any single feature in a locha is bad, then the entire locha has to be rejected. So let's say, for example, the first locha was bad. So the review just passes three lochas. And then you, we again reflatten them out into those individual changes. And because these are atomic changes, you can apply them parallelly. So you can have like this MapReduce style process that basically updates your uh, database. And you're ready to go. But wait, for the low price of shipping and handling, there is more. Because <laughs> when you change the database, there is a time gap. And there are sometimes there are policy issues. Like, you know, certain labels are not like, you know, as Facebook, we service like the entire world. So there are things that we have to do, which we call hot fixes, which actually are cosmetic fixes, or sometimes they're a little bit deeper. But these are changes that we have to do as a post-processing step before we ship it. But 
that's in a nutshell the how Facebook handles OSM ingestion and then finally updating the map. So back to the loaders, the mathematical properties are uh, the most important ones here are they are atomic. So each loader is independent and the guarantee is that if changed feature isn't exactly one loader. So you're going to get it reviewed only once. Uh, they are sort of uh, commutative. That means you could apply a bunch of them together or like, you know, apply one and then apply a bunch. So the, what this buy and the binary accept reject with the guaranteed geometric consistency, what this right. buys you is depending on your priorities and the size of your validation team, you could actually focus on parts of the world that are important to you rather than catching up to the whole world. So this allows us, this allowed us to do the proof of concept in the first place. And now we have the holy trinity of metrics, which is like velocity, which is a no-brainer. It's like, how many features are you getting in? My manager decides my bonus and salary based on that. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> efficiency, it's like, are you getting in the features you really want? So my favorite example is, you know, five fjords in Norway have more data than streets in Manhattan, but are they really important to your business? Should you be focusing on getting like the fjords on uh, Norway right, or are you more concerned about like, you know, somebody changing a label on a bridge in New York. So the change, so it's not really about quantity, it's about quality. And we try to have metrics around like, you know, how much are we ingesting what matters to us for that session. And the last one obviously is correctness. I mean, there is an easy way to catch up to the world, just blindly accept all the changes. But then there will be stuff that's broken. So uh, the trick is to do this on a cadence. So the vision actually simplifies because, so it simply means stay as fresh as possible while maintaining maximum correctness. I actually had the term absolute correctness there, and there was some pushback, like you can never be absolutely correct. But yeah, maximum possible correctness. So for this, when we did it for the whole world, we realized that the biggest bottleneck is manual review. Because a human has a traditional setup time they take a certain amount of time. The decision-making process has a fixed cost, and the, uh, people get tired too. Like you know, you just can't throw like ten thousand changes at a person in a day, and like <laughs> review it. But the biggest ask is nuance, because when we looked at the changes, the egregiously good and the egregiously bad changes, they are no-brainers. But in between, there is like this whole valley of stuff where you really need to think about it, and. For that, you do need manual review. Like the technical term for that is gnarly cases. Um, so when we looked at that, we sort of rephrased what our objectives are. So the way to catch up to the whole world is to maximize automatic decisions, like the no-brainer cases, and minimize human review, which is the corollary of that, and maximize efficiency. Like if a human is doing it, how can we make better tools, automation, UI, to sort of get, the, get through that faster? But the last one tops out at a certain level. So the investment we decided to do is into the first two. The second one we invested, we improved the UX of the tool we did, but there was a top out at how much a human can review. And obviously like somebody calculated a number that you need some 635 mappers to catch up to the world at a two week cadence, which actually the maths works out, but the economics doesn't. So, at a, and do this at a regular cadence. Like you can't afford to do this once a year and then let the data go stale. So machine augmented review is what we focused on this half. Before that, like when we looked at how humans review map changes, the logical model is that it's a tribal value. So a map data change comes in, somebody looks at it, and they get one of three answers. It's like yes, no, or I don't know. So I don't know means you have to like you know sort of the nuance kicks in. You need to look at is this good enough? Is this bad enough? Like, does this break something? Will this end up on a TechCrunch headline with a screenshot? Uh, so yeah, I mean, there are a lot of factors. <laughs> so we dove into this and we actually added a sort of a, we broke that black box open. So if you look at it, you're not really making the tribal decision right up front. You're looking at an approval probability and a rejection probability. You're looking at if this, how good is this change? How bad is this change? And then, the magic box called nuance, actually, not the text-to-speech system, like actual nuance, the dictionary term. Uh, it takes into these two probabilities and figures out now what my decision is going to be. So earlier, because most of the requirement gathering our mapper team sort of experience was geared towards editing, we are focusing on the top box. Like, is this good to go? But then when we looked at it at scale, we realized that the problem is inverted. 
your uh, ingestion is not editing. It's not about quality control or this. It's about keeping the bad stuff out. So you are better off investing in a high recall rejection system than a high precision approval system. So it just means that you, the question you have to ask yourself, is this shitty enough to keep back? <laughs> Is this going to end up in a TechCrunch headline? So that's the primary sort of inversion of thought we had to come to. And obviously, the yes and no means your machine, the machine augmented system has decided this. And the I don't know is what the volume of things that you're, because there is a common denominator to that. So that pipeline has a fixed throughput. So you maximize the top and you try to get as much off the human's plate as possible without losing correctness. Like, you know, you don't want to end up with like New York label change to something kind of stuff. So this sits in between uh, the generation of the logical chain sets and before the human review fire pipeline. And uh, the machine augmented review system, or as we like to call it, MARS. Do we still call it that? No, we don't. OK. So is, in a sense, a rule engine. It's basically the first iteration of this is a rule engine. And the individual rules can range from like heuristics, which encode like standard knowledge, whitelist, blacklist based approach, or some sort of thresholded uh, algorithmic checks. Uh, there is uh, there are some rules which are AIML based, like use computer vision, NLP, and a mix of all of these things. So the way it works is we take so the first step is we take all the changed features, and as you can see in this excellent diagram, if you can't read my handwriting, my father is a doctor, so this is <laughs> I inherited that. Um, so we take in a changed feature. We first classify what kind of feature it is, what and what kind of change happened to it. So then, depending on that, there is a rule chain that's applied. And I'll explain those rules later. So these rules actually spit out the feature and a score, which combines that approval rejection probability. And then this score helps us decide what is an auto-accepted feature and what is not, like an accepted feature, a rejected feature, and a feature that should be reviewed. Then what we do is we take the lochas, because remember, one feature can only be in exactly one locha. So we basically run a SQL query to find if all the features in a locha are approved. That means the whole cluster of that is auto-approved. And also I can mention that when one feature is bad, the entire loach has to be rejected. So uh, it's an, uh, so when you find a bad, an auto-rejected feature, like some find a profanity or something like that, you reject the whole set of changes. You'll catch it. And we actually tell our mappers to go fix it so that next time we run the session, we can take in the good one. These are the wins that we get out of completely approved lochas. But even the partial wins are that, let's say you had a locha that had 3,000 features, like you know 30 uh, roads and 100 nodes in uh, 30 ways and 100 nodes in each. Now we found that 95% of them got auto-approved. So now you have to, for, to accept this like 3,000 feature locha. All you need to do is look at one road. So we try to surface them back to the mappers in a way of priority that this moves uh, the needle a lot more. So some of the rules uh, that we use are like algorithmic curve similarity because, as you know, most of the features that people care about are like roads or like polygons and stuff like that. So this is like a variant of discrete pressure distance that we use. So basically, figure when we looked at the changes that people make to roads and the good changes, mostly it's like people add detail. Like they look at um, like a road is somebody had added an initial road, which was like a, just a perpendicular inverted L. And then somebody adds like smooth curve to it. So if you look at it from a difference or a delta point of view, it's a lot of changes. But if you look at it from what it actually did to the road, it just added detail. So you can accept it. Like let the editors figure out if the detail is nice or not, but this is an acceptable change. So by simply using like, you know, a jacquard similarity of bounding boxes or how much the centroid moved or and thresholding it, you can say that this change looks like a lot, but it's actually a simple change. And the other one is, uh, I think uh, everybody knows about the work that we did in inferring roads from satellite images. So I went to Daniel and said, can we invert this? Which is like, here is a road. Can you tell me on the satellite, does this match anything visual? Like, because most vandalism occurs in areas where there is nothing. Like somebody will go in the middle of the meadow and draw like a giant phallus. So that <laughs> means there is nothing visually backing it. So by just a simple inversion and making the model coarser, uh, we call it truthiness, because it's like a, I think. So what it does is it uses satellite images as ground truth. And we started with roads. It tells us, because all the heuristics can only address modifies. Like you have a before and after, you can run numbers on it. But if it's a create, you need to find something 
visually correlating it. So this helps us like pass roads that got created. And as you can see in this image, that was the road that got created and it does sort of fit into something that looks like a road on the image. So this passes. Now finally, tag chain significance. This is the tricky part because most of this is, because OSM uses freeform tags, when you change a tag, you're actually changing one or all of these three things, which is like you're changing what is the visual representation, like a label or something, which is something that someone sees and is the target for profanity, obscenity, or you're changing the meaning of something. Like you change Lake Michigan land use into a meadow, it suddenly a lake becomes a grassland. Or you are doing all sorts of other changes, which are changed like a internal representation, but they have no like visual or computational manifestation. So by classifying changes like this, uh, for the name changes, we have filters sourced from like our integrity work elsewhere and sort of work that we did, which try to figure out if this name change is profane or obscene. So that basically stops the bad changes and says that the so if a feature is only stuck on a name change, because almost all name changes get, have to go through human review, unless it's like a, like ST change to street or street change to ST, that's the only change, then we can pass it. But otherwise, a human looks at it. So the obvious cases of obscenity and profanity are blocked. This part is something that I'll cover at the end that we are still working on, like we have a first pass of this, is to figure out what is the significance of this tag change. And our first pass is to see that uh, per type classify that these are the ones that contribute to actually a semantic meaning of an entity or a feature. And if you change this, this is the amount of change it causes. And there is room for improvement here, but this is a combination of NLP and heuristics which tries to figure out this tag change, how significant it is. So then you can threshold it and say that I am only concerned about changes that show up on map, or I'm only concerned about changes that change like navigational characteristics of a road. So you can actually tweak the auto accept, auto reject probabilities on that. And then because we are doing a two year diff, some of the changes are very old and stable. Like a road name got changed and it hasn't changed, nobody has. So we kind of leverage the community as one of our rules that we view OSM as an eventually consistent state. And if there was a major change that's significant, but it has remained uh, in the middle of the sort of the heuristics uh, boundary. So we reduce the thresholds. There are some table stakes changes that never go off like obscenity checks or name changes, but it's like somebody changed um, a highway type and it has not been changed and it's in the middle of New York and it hasn't been changed back for eight months. So it's probably good to go. So this is like an adaptive strictness threshold, which allows us to increase the volume while maintaining correctness. And uh, this is something that we are working on. And I think almost everyone I talk to every year comes up with a similar idea. So that, that's why we know the idea is good. But implementing this is super hard. So this is about, so we approached it from the point of view is that since OSM, really there is like no orientation program or like this, anybody can come in and edit anything. But as people do more edits, they get better at making more complex edits. So the idea was to create a score of if I am a novice user and I'm attempting to change the entire road network of Europe, that's probably a change that should get blocked or reviewed. And I mean, OSM also has similar metrics. So we use this as a feature, as sort of a probability calculator of how probable is this change to be a bad one. Because the other way sort of is tricky. It's a hot hand fallacy. Just because you have been good till now doesn't mean you won't go rogue. So we can't auto accept it, but what we can do is that we can work towards creating uh, indicators of this change probably should be reviewed. I mean, this is probably a five year old changing Statue of Liberty, so block it. Uh, and additional signals is because once we started the session, some time has passed and in between if the newer changes have been reverted on OSM cha or any other kind of things, that's a signal to reject the change. So together they work towards as a backstop for the correctness. So with all this in place, when we had the mostly manual review and we targeted Thailand, we were able to get 3 million features in, which is like nodes, ways, and relations in um, like a couple of months thing. This half, we were able to get 75 million features in. So about 25x increase, the team remained the same. Most of the investments were in like the improved UI UX, which allowed mappers to get faster, as well as these algorithmic checks and heuristics and ML checks came in. But that's not all. Uh, this, this counts all the features that actually we were able to put in the map directly by auto-approving fully um, approved lochas. 
we are actually able to get around 90% of the features that are changed in OSM over the last one and a half, two years kind of thing approved by these rules. So these, this means it reduces that much uh, review sort of complexity and footprint on this. And the work is to get as close to 100% as possible on this because the denominator is so big. When you have even 90% of this still means that there is 200 million features left to review. So if you want to do this on a biweekly thing, you have to make it faster and faster. This never stops. Um, so the goal, <laughs> and that's why I still have a job. Um, <clears throat> it's excellent job security. So this means by 2020, we plan to do 1.8 billion features as close to this number as possible every two weeks. So how are we going to get there? So this is sort of, this is on a t-shirt somewhere. Catch up and stay caught up at a regular cadence. Um, if it's not, we should make some. Yeah. So the how we are going to get there, based on the learning, and this is a constantly evolving process, is like every time we find, we take on more data, we discover newer patterns. So obviously this can't, even this learning of patterns and all cannot be a manual process. We have to invest in like AI-assisted validation for other features, like extend truthiness to cover buildings, water bodies, land use. So get as close to passing things that have been created via like using satellite as a ground truth, either fully or partially. Obviously, the tag change significance is something that we we notice that most of the changes are purely tag changes, like because people refine the tags. So this is about creating sort of a vector embedding of the tags to see how much something changed by, rather than individually looking at the tags. Imagine this like n-dimensional space where each tag contributes to an axis and you know the effect of the tag on the thing and you change three tags, but they're like three very minor tags. Instead of having these heuristics or manually curated, can we actually create automated models that basically give you a Euclidean distance of in this space by changing these five tags, you went this far. So then we can threshold that and see that these changes aren't good or bad. And this is always the third item on any list I do, <laughs> conflation and cross-validation, which is like, can we move from like the OSM layer itself, like which is nodes, ways, and relations, and have some sort of cartographic recognition of these are the entities and this is how they have changed. Uh, road ch changes have to be evaluated differently from building changes to land use changes, things like that. Also, can we use existing data sets that we already have or know to be good to partially validate features. Like I already have Bing buildings and I have had people go over it and I know that these buildings exist. So can I use them as ground truth to like auto approve a lot of the changes to the buildings? Like we have POI data sets, can we use them to pass nodes? Uh, the last one is, this is something that uh, when I was talking to the Hootenanny developers I mentioned is we are thinking top down, how can we improve the process? So one of the things is a lot of the work has been very bottom up. It's like, this is how I approve buildings. This is how I approve changes. But if you remember the picture I uh, showed about how we were now thinking about approval and rejection, the idea now is can we take these two probabilities and apply like generative models, Bayesian models to sort of mimic what a human does. And I joke with uh, my team that what we have to do is build in more Dunning-Kruger into the model. Like the models have to be more confident. <laughs> Like they have to believe in their ability to triage these models. Because right now we are sort of erring on the side of like, you know, this is a model of imposter syndrome. Like they don't know how good they are. So we have to actually build in a sense of like this confidence into the models. And that is an iterative process and it'll keep on happening. And obviously maybe that's a talk for the next one. So that's all I had. Do we have time for questions? Sure. Okay, now that we're done with that, do we have questions? <laughs> yes. So, what, um, what percentage of, uh, the edge of the, the flow test were data that you rejected? So, auto reject, one of the things is we didn't actually hook it up to the pipeline for the rejection. We basically flagged them for a learning process. Uh, it's more about features, it's very low. Like, when you go through like close to 75, 80 million features approved, you find the number is in the less than 100, like it's in low three figures. Because a lot of the pre-filtering and all of that takes, because uh, OSM community is very good at fixing egregious errors or even like little like that. So that's one of the things we want to leverage going forward is can we actually, 
use that to shrink this middle ground, which is like the, re because the rejection is a very small probability. The approval is a high probability. So you can probably create trainable models for approval, but for rejection, you have to base it on beliefs, like Bayesian or generative approaches, where you have to actually sort of encode how a human approaches rejection, because there is going to be, it's very hard to find um, bad change training data. The number will always be super low. I hope that answers. Yes. Are you thinking about other types of obscenity and profanity in the math, like uh, loose shapes, things like that? Yes, uh, so that's a OCR-based check that we do, which recognizes this. But the investment in truthiness actually sort of addresses a lot of these rules. They are not like compartmentalized. Like, say, for example, geometric significance, the geometric change is a cheaper way of getting a lot of the more heavy AI checks. So these rules sort of work with each other. And I mean, my favorite, my dad used to crack this joke all the time, is uh, how do you carry water in a sieve? It's like you take three sieves and offset the holes so that you can run with the water. So that's how pretty much the rules work. Is our goal, the way we want to achieve correctness is by making sure that the gaps in one rule are covered by the other. So each of these rules has its strengths. So for example, obscenity, uh, like we have to deal with all the languages of the world. Like somebody goes and edits like a, something in the middle of New York and inserts a thigh obscenity. You have to catch that because that's a headline. Like, it doesn't show up in the map, but the day somebody finds it, it's gonna just gonna blow up. So it's an incremental investment, and then you have to also create backstop rules, like if a name changes in New York, send it for review. Or instead of a blocking review, send it for a spot check so that it can get fixed. And then we have the hot fix thing, which actually is like the, you can fix it before it goes live, if spot check catches it while it gets fixed in OSM. Yes. I mean, that's... Uh, does confidence in the truthiness of satellite imagery correlate to the age of the imagery? I'm asking because yes. early OSM days, folks would go out with GPS units and capture newly paved roads. And I'm worried, or not worried, I'm curious about the risk of rejecting really quality data that's been captured at an early stage. Um, and then is there sort of a review cadence for rejected features? Uh, yes, so one of the things about Lochas is you don't have to accept everything, right? It'll, the next one will catch up. So the your cadence will take care of you staying up to date. The second point is uh, this is mostly an acceptance, not a rejection. So it says go for review. Mm -hmm. So now once it goes to a review or they can look at more updated imagery and all of this because there is like these are very heavy computations. So we compute a lot of them offline. So there might be a lag. But by the time if newer satellite imagery has shown up, then a manual review will catch it. So all this says is it doesn't say reject this. It says, I don't find anything visually correlated to this. I mean, truthiness is basically like squinting really hard. Right? It just tries to see even does this, is this like visually, does this make sense? And if it can still find it, it passes it. Otherwise, it goes for review. So the, the downside to that is you humans have to review more. But that's how we built it. And the OCR catches like, known shapes like you know what some of those shapes are like we found this giant book somebody had created a giant boot i wish we had a photo of that kicking australia like <laughs> i mean that was obviously like you know it's there are so many features there that we can but these are so few and far between and people are creative in multiple different ways especially when lewdness is concerned so it's very hard to create like a model for this so these go for review for someone else yes Yeah. Carrying that forward as a guiding principle makes a lot of sense, but in that rejection step, is there information that's useful to a wider audience? Yes. So one of the things that I personally like about uh, Mars and. Uh, the reason when I pitch it, I always pitch it front when I'm internally explaining something, is explainability. So when a rule rejects something, there is a provenance of what rules acted on it and what the rules thought about this feature. So I can actually go to a feature and look at what rules acted on it and why it was rejected, or why it was, even for accept. Like say, so for example, there is a, uh, the algorithmic, so it says that I ran this check and I found 70% similarity, and since this feature is two years old, the threshold is 65%. If this were like, so, 
the problem with creating like a black box model is it just spits out numbers you really don't know anything and at this point we are more concerned about catching these nuances because our eventual goal is to build this end to end explainable sort of uh, high recall rejection filter and a lot of this also goes towards this sort of an active learning thing is that next thing we are planning on building is when somebody rejects like a manual feature rejects it's like how confident are you about this rejection I and mean, this becomes a negotiation process is like people who are highly concerned with quality they're like oh nothing goes they're like yeah come on this one is still a road like let it go so to answer your point that's something that's tunable and that's something we have kept it in the process to be as explainable as possible so that we ourselves can go back and learn from it anything else this is a follow up to that when you find really objectionable change sets how does that affect back to the back to OSS itself so mostly we flag it and we basically uh, so right now we, it's a manual process in that the it's it's basically like a diff review, right? So that when it, the diff gets rejected, somebody gives a comment. This is why it was rejected. So there is a button there for create a task, which creates like a mapping task for the editor to go fix it. Uh, sometimes they are rejected for very specific reasons. Like we might have policy reasons for not showing labels in certain areas because of like uh, other things like disputed borders, and they need to be treated differently. In that case, the comment is there should be a hot fix for this. Like borders are highly opinionated things based on who is displaying them and who is seeing them. So we triage manually as to whether this needs to go back to OSM or it's a fix that's just for us. So it needs to exist in the hotfix layer. An example for another company would be like say turn restrictions or sort of road covering or things like that. You have to triage, does this make sense only for you or for like the community at large? Eventually there'll be a model for that. <laughs> Right now, it's a human makes the decision. Yes, Trishti. I think in addition, what you're asking is who is making this back to OSM. Some of it goes also to the natural web path, and if we feel like it's a community-based decision, but if it's like clear profanity and stuff like that, we do make it to OSM. So the clear profanity, as I said, the community catches it. Like, so that's why we also look at like what baseline we took and in between has any like a week is about the time we have seen unless it's in like in a really obscure place uh, most of the high, high visibility profanity gets caught and reverted yeah cool thank you